So I'm um, Terry Ward, I'm an evolutionary ecologist here at uh, the University of New South Wales. I'm interested in the evolution of diversity, uh, why species live where they do, why they look and behave that they, the way that they do. So as a kid I was fascinated by uh, watching nature documentaries on television and as a family we would often go camping and I would wander off and spend hours just wandering through the bush looking at things following those ant trails, trying to figure out why they were doing what they were doing. And then once I got into high school, we started to get a little bit more sophisticated in what we were being taught. The fundamental principles of just doing science was something that I felt really um, enthusiastic about and something that I thought would be fantastic to do as a job. So the current influences on my research, I'm broadly interested in uh, the evolution of diversity. Why animals and plants look uh, the way they do, why a particular species live where they do, and indeed why you've got different species in the first place. A lot of my research thinking uh, stems from those foundational questions and, and general interest, I suppose. When I first started out, I guess I was most interested in when animals in particular, I, I suppose I'm a zoologist by training, uh, when animals live in a particular environment, they tend to adapt um, and become ideally suited to that environment through a process of natural selection. And so if you want to study natural selection in the wild, one of the ways to do that is to study different populations or different species in different environments. And you do that across a whole range of different species and populations. And you can understand why the diversity of those species might exist because of the types of environments they may be selected for. So that's where my general interest started out. And I'm still interested in those sorts of questions, but I've started to also um, investigate questions about why does a population exist in that, in that environment to begin with? So presumably um, they started out in a different environment and then dispersed, so moved into that environment and after they've done that they've started to become uh, selected for and become adapted to that particular environment. So now I'm really interested in that first question of well why do things exist where they do and if it's from transitioning from one environment into a new one and that's a process uh, that would be followed by adaptation, why do populations do that? So there is a general scientific um, justification or motivation for studying something like amphibious fish, our own evolutionary history, why are we are here, how did we get here. We've all come from an aquatic ancestral environment. There has to have been a transition from that environment out onto land for terrestrial vertebrates to evolve and diversify. So it's not only about understanding our own origins, but it's also about understanding why we've got so many different types of species on land and why we see so much uh, diversity in both their behavior and morphology. So it's, it's about us, but it's also about the diversity that we see in the natural world. It also helps us understand why things live where they do, which has conservation um, issues related to it. So if we do something to the environment, we clear some habitat, Obviously the species that used to live there has got, have got no habitat for them to live in. But say that we want to go and do some bush regeneration, we want to introduce that environment back. Are the species that used to be there, are they going to come back or are we going to get a completely different community? So understanding why organisms move from one environment into another, are they escaping predation, is it new resources in those environments, will help us decide about how effective our bush regeneration efforts may be on a very grand scale. When I was a kid, when I was um, going out camping with the family and I would move out and just look at all sorts of different things um, uh, out in nature and it was all that diversity was, was absolutely fascinating. For example, I might be following a, an ant trail and, and wondering about what they were doing, but of course out there there's all sorts of different types of ants. They uh, look slightly different, they do slightly different things in terms of where they live, um, how they behave, so there's that diversity. So that was a, a general thing that I've always been interested in. And then once I got to university, actually even in high school as well, I started to be exposed to, well, what are the processes that lead to that diversity? For example, natural selection, um, things adapting in different types of environments. So that interest has always been there. And then uh, when it got to a stage where I started to do my own research, um, it was a combination of I love going out into the wild, into the field and studying things in their natural environment. So I don't uh, often come into the lab and do a lab oriented type of work. I'm a field wildlife zoologist, if you will. 
Um, it's going out to different locations and studying them in that context and trying to understand how natural selection would operate in that sort of environment to create the diversity that I'm, I'm trying to document out there. Broadly speaking, um, if we think about why animals or um, any organism moves from one environment into another, uh, there has to be some sort of benefit and evolutionary incentive to do so. Typically that's perhaps there are new resources in that new environment that are unavailable or in very low densities in the home environment. So the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, if you will. Or sometimes organisms are pushed out of their home environment, uh, if it's an animal, through predation. There's lots of nasty predators. So you move into an adjacent environment to escape those nasty predators. Other things can be uh, parasites. If it's a plant, herbivory is a form of predation. So as a, as a research scientist at a university, um, typically I work with a range of different people, um, including colleagues that are at the same uh, level as I am, and we collaborate. They'll bring different expertise. For example, we might be interested in some of the genetic underpinnings of behaviour or morphology. I'm not a geneticist, I'm a wildlife zoologist, so I'll team up with a geneticist who's a colleague and we'll collaborate on the same project. The other way is we work often with uh, students, so students at the undergraduate level. So if you come in and do a science degree, uh, you're almost certainly going to be doing some hands-on research. I have a number of uh, undergraduate volunteers that help with the process of doing our research projects. Um, in addition to that, we have PhD students and master's students. And so I'll direct them towards particular projects that are related to the evolution of diversity or why particular species live in the environments they do or why do they move from one environment into another, depending on the types of interests those students have. And as a group, we have a very diverse range of different projects, individual projects, all going at one time. But as a cohesive group, we're all studying the same general question of the evolution of diversity in the natural world. So the data that we collect is pretty variable. Um, we can go from observation, so a lot of our research is driven by an inquiring question that we, we see something interesting in the environment. So why do you have a range of different fish? Why do you have a range of different um, ants? And then we formulate uh, hypotheses associated with that. And then we can actually test those hypotheses using a different set of data. We can actually go out and observe where things literally live and measure things about their environment, the temperature, the light, rainfall, all those sorts of things. But we can also perform manipulative experiments where we change something in the environment. So perhaps we introduce something into their environment that wasn't there before, and then we see how those animals react. Do they move away from that particular environment or do they stay? So we can measure their, uh, their comfort zone. We call it an ecological niche. So there are key principles that you can test. And in this particular system, we tested um, the influence of predation. So we return to uh, one of the islands, Rarotonga, uh, where there is a terrestrial species, but there's also several amphibious species and the aquatic ancestors. So you can view this as evolutionary steps in terms of the transition onto land. And we investigated, well, what's the predation environment on land like? What's the predation, more importantly, within the water? And it's purely observation. We used scuba and snorkeling to measure predation in the water. Uh, we actually built uh, plasticine mimic blennies. So we took a mould off a live blenny and you pack it full of plasticine, the same colour as uh, the fish look like in life, and you get a wonderful, highly realistic model. And if you put those in the environment, the predators will tend to attack those models thinking they're prey thinking they're the live blennies. So we did that on land and we did that in the water and uh, the predators would uh, attack those models and we can actually measure what's predation like on land, what's it like in the water. Turns out that predation in water is really severe, it's really common. So living in water in the intertidal zone specifically is a really nasty environment if you're a blenny fish. You're gonna get predated upon. A big fish is gonna come and eat you. So one of the advantages of coming out of the water, you still have predators there, in particular birds, but they're nowhere near as frequent. And in the splash zone, you can come out of the water and you can live without having that big pre uh, pressure of being eaten. Other aspects of our research, we actually use the existing peer-reviewed uh, literature and we do things like meta-analyses. So 
Often in science, people are studying the same sorts of questions in a variety of different systems. Um, so I study it in um, fish, other people do it in birds, other people do it in mammals, but they're all the same general questions. And we can actually compile that literature and see what the findings are um, and use statistical methods in this process of uh, meta-analysis to ask what is the general answer across all these diverse range of different systems to this particular question. Why do organisms live in the particular environment they do? Is it because they're particularly suited, adapted to that environment? Or have they been pushed into those environments because of predation or harsh environmental uh, variables in their home environment, things like drought. And then you can compile those literature and, and perform statistical analyses to actually test that uh, question at a very broad level. So rather than going out and collecting data yourself, you're actually using existing literature. You can also use existing large data sets that have been accumulated by citizen science. Um, and a whole range of different avenues. So we can um, estimate predation on land using these plasticine models and we can do it in the water, right? You can uh, count the number of those models that have been attacked on land, count them in the water, and maybe you'll have a high proportion of those models that have been attacked in the water. But you still need to be able to use statistics to determine the probability of that proportion of attacks just occurring by chance. If you went out there on a different day, maybe you would have got a different attack rates just because there happened to be more fish swimming through that particular area at that particular time. So it's absolutely critical that you still use uh, statistics. But having said that, so we do statistics and we can find that the probability of the attack rate that we were getting on land versus water is highly improbable purely by chance. But now the question is, that's a correlation. That's an observation. Um, it's not necessarily causation. So perhaps there are other reasons why fish are moving out onto land, or perhaps there are other reasons why predation on our models um, was lower on land than it was in water. So we still need to go in there and do um, experimental work to actually manipulate the system to try and figure out, is it predation that's pushing these fish out of the water? So one of the ways we can do that through observation rather than experimental work is that we can take advantage of the changes in tide. So as the tide comes in, the volume of water increases. So the environment for aquatic environment effectively uh, gets uh, greater. Now predators are larger fish. They need a larger area, larger water to go um, swim through. So as the tide comes in and as it goes out, the change in predator density is through time. And so as the tide comes in, we see through our own observations, a lot more predatory fish coming in. And then we see those amphibious blennies progressively moving out of the water onto land as a consequence. As the tide goes down, the predators move out of that environment and we see that those amphibious fish are then moving back into the water as a consequence. So again, it's, it's a suggestive of causation. It's the predators specifically that are pushing these fish out of the water. But really we would need to do a manipulative experiment. So we can bring these fish into captivity, into aquaria, um, and then the obvious experiment would be to perform is have the amphibious blennies in the same tank as some predators, some other tanks that don't have the predators, so it's just the amphibious fish, and see whether we're getting a change in all oh, those amphibious fish are coming out of the water when there's a predator about. The reality is, is that we can't really do that. So we change that experimental system by introducing cues of potential predator. So rather than putting a predator into an aquarium tank, which ethically might not be a particularly good idea, you're effectively feeding your amphibious fish to those predators in that sort of a setting. We can simulate a, pr a potential presence of a predator by introducing water that has the smell of a predator. We keep them in a separate tank, we introduce that water, smells like a predator, those amphibious fish should start to move out of the water as a consequence. So it's an indirect way that we can test that causation. Is it predation specifically or something else that's correlated to predation but it isn't predation that's pushing these fish out of the water? One of the uh, large projects that we're currently working on is uh, the diversity in amphibious fish. So a lot of people don't realise, but there are actually a number of fish that have progressively moved out of water onto land. And as a uh, scientific question, that's interesting because in our evolutionary history in the late Devonian, one of the key events in our history was the transition from an aquatic lifestyle out onto land. And as a consequence, all the vertebrate, terrestrial vertebrates that we have on the planet at the moment 
have originated from that single event. So there's a big question about how did things that are aquatic first move from that environment out onto land. Now if you think of a fish, they're ideally suited to living in water. They have gills, they're streamlined for swimming, all those sorts of adaptive morphologies. So when it comes down to understanding why fish would come out of the water, it's a very broad question that's related to our own evolutionary history, but it's also a very um, big question in terms of how animals adapt to their different environments. So we've actually tackled this question from a range of different perspectives. The first one was to just assess how common it is for fish to come out of the water in the sense of how many different types of species of fish make burrows onto land. And we did that uh, first by having a look at the literature. There's all sorts of reports of amphibious fish um, from mudskippers, perhaps the most familiar, to a whole range of uh, uh, killifish in mangrove systems, all sorts of different environments, uh, all sorts of different types of fish. And when we look at those together, uh, we see that the evolution of things coming out of the water in terms of fish has actually happened multiple times, not only in our history, but in present day. So we, we've uh, quantified at least 30 to 40 independent origins of fish coming out of the water. So we followed that up by focusing on one particular group. And these are called blenny fishes. Now these fish are really diverse. There's hundreds, thousands of different species of these particular uh, uh, fish. But they're interesting, not only for their diversity, but because of there are a number of species that have come out of the water. And in some cases, they've come out of the water and those fish no longer go back into the, um, into the aquatic environment at all. So they're really in that uh, transition into a terrestrial environment. So what we did is we traveled to a number of different locations across the world. We started in Guam, uh, we went to the Cook Islands, Rarotonga, Tahiti, Fiji, um, over into the Indian Ocean, and you can go to all these different uh, locations and we were finding examples of different types of amphibious fish. So what we would do is we would find locations where we'd have these amphibious fish, we would take tissue samples and we can get their DNA. We also do a lot of snorkeling to actually have a look at all the aquatic uh, species of the same blenny groups again taking tissue samples and we can get their DNA and we can use statistical methods to uh, create what is called a phylogeny. So we can determine how close related different species of fish are. So we can actually figure out their evolutionary history as a consequence of that. And so with additional observation of those species that are actually spending time out of the water, we can use that scaffold of that phylogeny to then reconstruct the evolutionary history of that behaviour onto that phylogeny. And when we do that, we can see that there are a cluster of species that have evolved just once in their shared evolutionary history, the ability to come out of the water, and those ones are the very terrestrial ones that we see today. But in other areas of that phylogeny, independent origins of those fish coming out of the water have also occurred. So globally, across all fishes, there's numerous 30-odd independent origins across multiple families of fish. When we look in one family of fish, these blennies, we see that there are multiple origins even within families as well. So if you take that together, we can see that uh, fish coming out of water is as unusual as that seems, um, is perhaps not as unusual as you might think. So then we would follow up. The next question relating to that is, why would fish come out of the water? Again, you've got an organism that appears to be ideally suited to their particular environment. It's a fish, lives in water, it has all the adapt adaptations for surviving in water. So then there's the question of why on earth they would come out of the water. So we're now starting to do a, a series of more focused uh, ecological uh, studies to try and answer that question. So it's one of these situations where you have observation in the field suggesting a particular phenomenon causing what you're observing and then coming in and you're testing it in a variety of different ways. It may not literally be putting predators in the water, but you can still test it through indirect observation, perhaps the influx of predators as the tide comes in and out, or introducing predator ascent into an aquaria where amphibious blennies are. Mm -hmm. So all those connected together can help us make a conclusion about is it really predation that's causing these fish to come out of the water? We'll perform our, uh, our research and then we'll, we'll spend a lot of time analysing it using statistics and distinguishing correlation and causation. And then one of the primary vehicles of communication is that we need to uh, write it up as a report. 
as a paper and then we send it out for peer review where other scientists, our peers, will go through those uh, papers and, and it's called the scientific process, it's peer review process um, and they'll suggest improvements, um, say well perhaps you can't make that conclusion because you haven't got quite the right data or have you considered this alternative conclusion to the same data that may not actually be the explanation that you were thinking of. That process of uh, peer review in science results in a published paper and that published paper becomes uh, the public domain. The other way that we try and communicate our research is through conferences. We'll go to a large conference with lots of other scientists and we'll get up and we'll present. We'll have some slides of amphibious fish doing some really interesting things and we'll talk about the science and the study that we did. But one of the key ways to convey science to the general public is through the media. So we'll also uh, put together uh, press releases and the uh, media will pick those up and we'll often get calls for interviews. Sometimes it's radio, sometimes it's over the phone, sometimes it's television and a whole range of different um, avenues as well. In addition to that, um, that media interest will often generate outreach opportunities. So I'll often go to schools uh, to talk about my research at a very general level perhaps talking about why it's interesting to do science as a career, but also some of the specifics about the particular projects that I do. So when I was a student, um, I loved science uh, in high school, uh, loved biology, um, but I didn't think that doing science as a career was really that attainable. Um, I went to my career advisor and he was good, um, and he gave me options of um, things that were science related, but they really weren't the inquiry based types of careers that I was um, thinking of. My thought was is that if you wanted to be a scientist and you wanted to do science, you're more likely to go into the medical sciences and become a doctor. I had no idea, even as I went uh, to university to do a Bachelor of Science, that you can actually be a scientist. It never occurred to me that my lecturers were actually, more often not, research scientists. So my advice to uh, any student that's interested in science is, is to pursue your passion. If you really love what you're doing and you love finding out things, then science is definitely a career option for you. The reality is, is that the number of avenues for possible careers in science is almost endless. Um, you've got a whole range of different um, avenues to go through. Environmental consultancy, you can be working for the government, national parks. You could be like me, you can actually be an academic and research scientist and this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the, at the end of the day, uh, the key thing is to follow your passion um, and if you do science and if you do research science, um, you're actually making discoveries almost on a daily basis that no one else knows about. And so this is the reason why it's important for us to communicate our results, to share it for the rest of the world. But literally, we go out there and we study things for the first time and we find out things and it's absolutely fascinating. So if you want a career, um, science is definitely one you should consider. There are days where you're doing the same thing over and over again and it seems very repetitious. Uh, that's what science is about. It's about rigour. It's about doing things over and over again, making sure that it's not by chance, but there's some uh, consistency with it, partly through statistics. So we're doing a lot of the same stuff over and over again, um, but it's really important to have that passion because it will drive you through that, those days where it seems like you're just doing the same thing and maybe it seems like there's a dead end there. But if you follow your passion, um, more often than not, you make that discovery, perhaps unexpectedly, and it's those moments that really remind you about the joys of why you're doing science in the first place.